All right, let me share my screen here. That should work, right? <laughs> All right. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, as Barbara said, I'm, I'm Katie Fry. I'm a librarian at the Center for Astrophysics in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And I'm the curator for the Unified Astronomy Thesaurus. And I wanted to start this morning by giving a brief overview of the UAT. So first of all, what is the UAT? <laughs> Well, it is an interoperable and community supported project from the American Astronomical Society, which is made available as an open thesaurus. Um, I'm sorry, I am I appear to be at the library, but I'm at home. <laughs> um, so the, the UAT is an open thesaurus that formalizes astronomy concepts and their interrelationships. It originated as a merger of the physics, astronomy, physics and astronomy classification schema, the IEU and IVOA thesauri, and the astronomy subject keywords that were being used by many of the astronomy journals. Unlike those previous efforts, which usually um, organized their groups into you know, broad categories and didn't have much structure, the UAT has a deep hierarchy that provides context for each concept and shows how they're related to each other. The UAT also follows established standards in the story and vocabulary development. And so I mentioned those previous efforts, and um, none of them had been maintained with regularity. The most recent update made to any of those previous systems was the astronomy subject keywords, and that was done in 2013. This meant that newer disciplines um, had been traditionally underserved or perhaps not even represented at all in these other systems. Additionally, these keyword lists were developed before the growth of the modern semantic web and don't take advantage of machine readable formats. The UAT on the other hand, assigns each concept a unique identifier in the form of a URI, and that allows online tools and systems to link directly to those concepts and to see the relationships um, via the, those tools. And so since I mentioned that those previous systems hadn't been maintained regu regularly, so how are we planning to do those? keep the UAT updated and maintained? Well, first of all, the UAT does have a regular schedule of being updated every year, usually in mid to late December. Uh, in fact, the next release is scheduled for next week, Friday. And as I said earlier, the UAT is community supported. It relies on feedback from astronomers and researchers to identify gaps in coverage. And we're also actively reaching out to scientists and, and journal editors for their assistance in filling out those gaps and seeing um, where the new fields in astronomy are emerging and, and what we need to do to, 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 to cover those topics. The AAS journals adopted the UAT as their source of keywords in July of 2019, so I wanted to share some brief usage stats to demonstrate how the UAT has been used so far. So this is just a word cloud of the most commonly used concepts, but I also have here a list of those concepts um, and with the number of articles that are, have, that are using those concepts. Um, again, this is as of September, 2020, the last time I checked the stats. Since, since July of 2018, um, all the papers have used the UAT and there have been about 4,500 pu papers published um, as of September. In total, over 1,400 unique UAT concepts have been used across these articles. And to put that into some context for you, the astronomy subject keyword system only had about 600 total concepts. So users are selecting over twice as many concepts now as were available in the previous system used by the journals. In addition, the UAT has about 2,100 concepts in total, which means that in just over a year, already two thirds of the UAT has been used. So it looks like there's some strong adoption and it's kind of re-emphasizing and reinforcing the fact that these concepts are useful and needed by our community. So you might be wondering where you can find the UAT. And primarily the UAT is meant to be integrated into online tools and systems. You can find the UAT wherever you would find astronomy information be that journey, journal articles, data sets, applying for telescope time, and so on. 
In fact, the rest of the speakers today will be talking about how the UAT integrates into their various platforms. But you can also search and browse through the UAT on our main website. And if you're interested in adding the UAT to your own platforms, the machine readable files can be found on GitHub. And I'm going to switch to a browser and hopefully this will work. The live demo is always iffy. <laughs> So this is the UAT website. It's astrothesaurus.org. Uh, the slide should have shown that. And from here, if you wanted to search through the UAT, I recommend using the Select Concepts widget. You click here. And this page kind of mirrors um, what you would see at the AAS journals if you were submitting an article. And it's just useful in general as well. So you can start typing in a concept here. And it will bring up a list of everything that matches. Um, everything from active solar cro cro chromosphere, and well, the list is quite long. You might wonder well, some, why some of these are showing up, like exoplanets or dwarf planets. And the reason is, if you were to click onto it, you'll get more information about the concept, and you'll see that this concept, dwarf planets, has alternate terms, solar system, dwarf planets, and dwarf planets, solar system. So the widget is searching on not only the concept itself, but every alternate term that we have in the thesaurus for it. So as you keep typing, it will keep narrowing it down and giving you all the available options. So solar corona is pretty limited, which is good. So again, here on the right, um, in addition to seeing the concept itself, you can see that hierarchy I was talking about a little bit. You can see more general concepts. So solar corona is under solar atmosphere. And you can see more specific concepts. So the, the solar K corona, solar coronal plumes, those are all child concepts under solar corona. And you can also see related concepts. Um, so, and I'll show a little bit of the hierarchy, but we have solar astronomy, solar physics, and, and stellar astronomy. You know, stars and the sun are, the sun is a star, right? But they're studied very differently. And so we have different concepts to describe those in the UAT. And this just points out that this concept of solar corona is related to stellar corona. And you can click on that to see information about that particular concept. Other ways to view the UAT is to use this explore option here. We have the alphabetical browse, which is pretty much what you'd expect. It's just an alphabetical list of all the concepts. So if you have one in mind, it can be just really easy to scroll in and find it to see if it's there. Um, hierarchical browse, I mentioned this a little bit earlier. This starts with showing you all of the top level concepts and you can pop them open to kind of drill down into the hierarchy of the UAT itself. And if you click on one of the concepts, it brings up that same information that was shown on the other screen. Something I wanna point out here is the URI. Actually, I also wanted to point it out on the other screen as well. <laughs> um, but each concept has a unique URI and a unique identifier. And these are, this is kind of what the concept is, is this identifier. And it has this human readable label on top of it. And this is what makes the UAT interoperable and machine readable and usable on the semantic web. If I go back here, I'll just briefly show what I what I missed is that if you click on one of these concepts, um, you can see the numerical identifier here, and you can use that to extrapolate the URI for the concept. Sorry, my, my cat. <laughs> um, the UAT is also available as an API, which can be used by developers to to access and get information about the concepts, and again, a machine readable format. The last thing I wanted to show here is the UAT on GitHub. And I mentioned on the slide that the files to integrate into you know, a SCOS compatible system are found here. The main file for the UAT is right here, UAT.RDF. This is the current release version of the UAT in that machine readable format. But there's a lot of other stuff here as well such as the release notes that will kind of explain the differences between the current version and previous versions of the UAT. You can find in here crosswalks between the UAT and 
those older thesauri like IVOA and IAU thesauri, as well as the astronomy subject keywords. If you're trying to convert from one system to another, to, to this one, this could help. We also have information about um, like the license of the UAT, how to contribute to the UAT, and some additional file formats that could be useful depending on your, on your use cases, such as the UAT in JSON and the UAT as a CSV file. But primarily the UAT RDF is the main file of the UAT. Let me get back to the presentation. Okay, so I have a couple slides here that were just in case the live demo didn't work. So I'm just kind of showing everything that we went through. Okay, so again, this is where you can find the UAT in order to kind of search through it, to browse through it, and to find those base files. But as I was saying, the UAT can be found in other places right now. And as I said, the rest of the speakers will be talking about how the UAT will integrate. So at this point, um, I can take a few questions and then I'll pass it on to those speakers. Um, everyone, if you'd like to uh, raise your hands and ask interactively, that's fine. You can put your questions into the chat. We'll be saving that and circulating it later. And we also have um, uh, a, a web, site web page uh, with uh, information. Katie, do you have that? Can you put that in the chat? Uh, yes. So we'll take a few questions now and then um, uh, move on because we have about 15, 20 minutes built in at the end for general Q&A. Okay, if there are no questions for Katie at this point, um, we will move on to Marcus Demleitner, who's um, representing the International Virtual Observatory Alliance. Marcus? And is that a question? I do see a couple of hands of the participants, yeah. Okay, sorry, is there, is there a question? I think Anne has one. Okay, go yeah, ahead. It's actually more of a go comment ahead. question. I was interested in the statistics, but did you realize that the PDS is using the UAT for keywords in the DOI database? Oh, There's no. Another potential source of statistics for you. Excellent. That would be great. I will definitely look into that. Um, I, I just was looking at the journals because that was like an easy place to get the information from ADS. So. Thank yeah, you. we're we're just starting, but we're all using DataCite as our primary repository. So there's an API there that will let you pull up statistics. Well, that's great, great. to hear about. Thanks, Anne. Okay, Sherry Winkleman, you have your hand up. Uh, yeah, I was curious. Um, this is probably more for the AAS journals, but in general, how is the UAT reaching out to um, expand this the the Soros in some sort of systematic way? Um, I'm with Chandra and I'm very interested in the high energy keywords, but uh, at, at the last time, which is probably a year ago that I looked, they didn't seem to be expansive enough to really cover um, a lot of the concepts that were coming out of the high energy community. Um, but I don't know if there's a systematic program, like for instance, is the AAS journal when somebody submits a paper, if they can't find keywords that they feel adequately address their paper, can they suggest more keywords? Is that a systematic sort of thing? And is that um, very successful? So yes, we, we uh, the first step in getting more awareness of the UAT is, is, is this webinar in part, but yes, indeed, um, people can suggest new terms. Uh, we have our team of editors to help um, uh, curate those terms. Katie, do you want to say a little bit more about the specific process? Um, well, I don't know what, I don't think there's a method when writing an article to submit new keywords at that moment. That might be a nice thing to add. I think there is though a link that points out to, um, I think the UAT GitHub page, because we use GitHub issues. I use that at least to track the suggestions that have been submitted. Um, and also to track kind of the decisions made and the discussions that happen surrounding those concepts. It's always good to hear when someone uh, identifies a gap because that, that means there's something more to be added and we want to make sure the UAT is as comprehensive as possible for all these use cases. 
Oh, right. I will be following up with you, Sherry. <laughs> yeah, it's just my experience, at least with uh, linking data to papers and trying to get authors to put things, to, to take that last step when they're submitting a paper rarely happens. And especially if they have to go to GitHub and try to figure out what is this new thing. Um, so it seems to me that um, many of these efforts, and I think the, uh, the virtual observatory suffered from this a bit at the beginning too, is not getting out there to the community and really soliciting support from the community right from the get go. And mm -hmm. you can put in a lot of effort and then it doesn't go very far. And there's so much potential with this that I think it's worth putting in that, trying to figure out how to get the astronomers actively involved with supporting it themselves. I think um, kind of to follow up, another reason we have the releases in, in mid to late December is so that at the AAS meeting in January, we're able to go out there and say, here's a new version and, and talk with people who show up at well, AAS. So that is kind of you know limited amount of people compared to the whole astronomy community, but it's a good a good way to get started and to get people excited and looking at it because we just had a new version. So yeah. Okay, thank you, Sherry. Any other questions for Katie before we move on to Marcus? Okay, Marcus, over to you. Good. So let me see. Sharing. Right. So this is going to be about um, the use of the UAT in the VO. Um, apologies if I have to leave then later because I have another, um, uh, you know, uh, thing to do. Um, but meanwhile, uh, uh, thanks for, for giving me the opportunity to start uh, this application thing off. Uh, a brief reminder first, what is the VO and uh, what's that registry thing that we are going to talk about? Uh, the Virtual Observatory is a, essentially a system of conventions and protocols, in short standards, that let machines work with astronomical data. Uh, and part of this is the registry, which is essentially a searchable set of metadata uh, that making that astronomical data discoverable by, again, machines. Now, as a human, you can still get an idea what's in there. There are web pages that let you explore that. For instance, uh, dcg-0.org slash vir. Uh, you don't have to uh, take down all these URLs. I'm going to show a URL of the lecture notes here at the end. So um, in the VO, we now have a standard that's called vocabularies in the VO. Actually, we had that for a long time, but we now over, uh, 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 so, basically putting out a new major version um, because it turned out we need a lot of hierarchically organized, well, essentially word lists. So these include, for instance, time scales, data set component types, which um, yeah, anyway, if you're curious, talk to me, uh, relationships, whatever. So we have lots of different, mostly rather small vocabularies. And we're now keeping them at this point here, uh, rdi.net slash rdf. And if you go there, you'll see a list of these things. And each of these vocabularies uh, is available in this RDF XML format that uh, Katie has already mentioned. Uh, it's also available in other representations of RDF, in particular Turtle. Uh, you can get an HTML page, which is the basic mechanism how users would find these descriptions and uh, would find out more about a term. And there is um, a form called desize, that simple semantics that we've come up with in particular to make uh, filling the use cases that we've identified for these kinds of vocabularies in the VO, dead simple desize stands, stands for dead simple semantics. Uh, the conventions governing this again, uh, in, in the lecture notes, you'd see a link. Uh, and if you are uh, interested in these vocabularies at all, you're uh, really invited to look into, uh, to look at this uh, uh, new standard. It's under review. So if you find something that um, you would find unwise, uh, by all means, chime in. Now, the UAT is one of these uh, vocabularies, although the, by far the most uh, the, the largest one. Uh, 
how did it come in there? So essentially in VO resource 1.1, so VO resource is the standard that um, sort of lays the foundation for this registry thing. It's the basic metadata schema. Uh, and in there, um, it, so in 2018, we overhauled that. And in there it says terms for subject and subject are essentially keywords should be drawn from the unified astronomy thesaurus. So I put that in, I'm actually the author of this overhaul um, and didn't, didn't pause to ask, well, what does this actually mean? I thought, well, okay, so we have this, we have, we'll have a, a list of, of words and so that's where Marcus, I think we lost your audio for a moment. For a while, yeah. Marcus, can you hear us? I can hear you. Okay, now we can hear you. Sorry, we lost the audio for a little bit there. Um, sorry about that. Not sure what happened. Okay. Yeah, but uh, you can hear me now again. Yes, we can hear you now. Thank you. Uh, okay, good. So I was just um, talking about the little adoption problems. So again, via resource said, use the unified astronomy thesaurus. Now, what does that mean? Um, the problem with this is that lots of VO practice relies on something human readable. So if something is about black hole, there should be a string black and a string hole uh, in these subject keywords. Uh, so the, using the UAT URIs would have been really uh, well, disruptive uh, and, and contrary to common uh, to modern fashion, I think disruptive is usually something we shouldn't have. Uh, so I thought about, well, perhaps we can get away with the preferred labels. So these human readable things that you have but they're really designed to be changeable and there are good reasons why that should be true. So, uh, and also there was the, the thing, so we have this design thing, this simplified way of uh, solving our direct use cases, bypassing the, the various complexities of RDF. Um, so eventually we decided to have an IVOA mirror of the UAT. Um, you can see that at that URI, RDF, so that one is our normal vocabulary U, uh, URI, and then just slash UAT. Uh, what does mirror mean? Well, so our concept URIs look a bit different. Uh, they are ivoa.net um, hash, and then the preferred label at the first map. At the same time, we memorize our preferred label at the first map is the same thing as um, the URI, uh, the UAT URI, and that's actually machine readable. Um, that was uh, the idea of this, uh, the, one of the major ideas of the um, uh, semantic web was to enable these kinds of things. So we are using this uh, for our profit now. This machine readable mapping between these IVOA URIs and the UAT URIs, um, that is part of, of our part of this of this mirror vocabulary so that uh, clients who actually are smart and who figure out um, RDF can figure out uh, that what we are talking about is actually something from UA uh, from UAT. There's a programmatic mapper so each time something happens in UAT uh, a program runs and that program enforces this stable mapping and creates new mapping items as necessary. Details on this is in uh, a, a proposed endorsed note. So some one of these uh, papers, we uh, articles we use to manage SART um, standards in the VO. 
Uh, that's a rough draft, but perhaps looking at it, it might be worth it anyway, if you're curious about uh, real world, not real world usage, but so things we had to thought of, think about I think when someone joins, we lose Marcus's audio. Hmm. Marcus? Mute. Okay, so it's this, am I back? Yes. Oh gosh, well, welcome to Zoom, gotta love it. Um, da -da 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 -da. Right. So um, I was just reporting my experiences um, when uh, in, in adopting this UAT scheme. Uh, one thing was I have, uh, I'm, I'm running a data center myself. I had about 500 subject keywords in there, uh, not different ones, but altogether 500 subject keywords. I've migrated those to this new UAT scheme. My experiences were, well, I had some infrastructure services in there, for instance, a validator for identifiers or, I don't know, DOI assignment or whatever. Uh, that doesn't really work uh, with the UAT. So I was wondering, perhaps we could have a VO supplement that is just legal for this subject um, field. But then I thought, do we really need this? Is there a discovery use case? So I believe the, uh, the infrastructure services, uh, that is fine. I mean, they, they, don't, they probably don't need uh, a representation of that subject keyword. Um, I had a few minor points, which I already communicated at least to um, Katie. Um, so something like a concept, this is dealing with multi-messenger astronomy, or perhaps, I mean, I don't even know how this concept should be called. It's something that says this is a resource that deals with cubes. Uh, I think they're discovery use cases, which is what I usually think about uh, for having this kind of thing. But from this experience, I, I really have to say um, we in the VO, it, it looks like we're ready to go with the, with the UAT. Um, I had previously used the um, IVOA thesaurus um, and the UAT was I think by and large an easier go. The next thing I did is, so the VO has this, the registry contains subject keywords from all the resources we have in there. So what I did is I mapped those. Um, so we had uh, a bit more than a thousand of these um, different concepts in there from, I don't know, probably 200,000 keywords that were in there. Um, so I, I just went through them and manually said, well, this is this UAT keyword or it's unfixable. Uh, that's usually because people uh, abuse the subject keyword to um, perhaps just say, uh, this is the instrument name. That's fairly common. They put in probe names, telescope names, or it's bad syntax where people just concatenated lots of keywords with commas. Uh, then I had 45 keywords that might want a representation in the, in the UAT. Of course, that's far fewer concepts, probably 10 concepts or so, because people, of course, had different representations for the same concept. Uh, I think, now I, I'm not sure whether I shared those already. And I had 633 plausible mappings. Um, if you look at that, mm, this note I was mentioning, this one, the adopting the UAT as an IVOA vocabulary node. I'm making a, a, a plot of the frequency of frequencies of these, um, uh, of these keywords. Uh, that should, in general, if it's language or something like that, that should have, uh, should have the shape of a tip distribution, whatever that may be. Uh, look at, the, um, at that paper. Now, and, and that, what I find in the VO is that it's non, strongly non-Zipfian, which means that this mapping actually costs something. It, it's missing many specialized subjects. That's at least my interpretation. So I'm going to um, Bambi I people in the VO to actually um, not rely on that stupid mapping, but use uh, proper UAT keywords. Anyway, um, so again, here is a URI in the, um, in the lecture notes that you're going to see in a second. 
Um, and, and I'd be happy if you reviewed these mappings that I made between old keywords and UAT concepts uh, that I think would be interesting information, at least for me. Uh, another thing that I did based on that is called Semberibro, a semantics-based registry browser. So that's uh, one of these um, uh, browser games, as if you will. It's a way to browse the, the registry uh, using the UAT. So this is a, a part of the UAT graph. And so whenever a concept has actually matches in the, in the um, registry, in the VR registry, when there are services for that, um, you see these little um, IVUA icons. Uh, again, you can try that yourself. I don't know how am I in time. If I can have a minute, I can briefly show you how that works. So I could go here and you can see again, this is a, a relatively compact UAT browser. So if I'm going for my black hole, then I'm going to select black hole physics. I'm saying go. And then I have this part of the UAT and then I can follow this. And if I wanna see, I don't know um, uh, what uh, resources do we have for bla blazers, I'm going there and I'm ending up at Vir, and of course it's broken. I don't know why. Have I really broken it already? Anyway, so the idea is that as you go from, uh, as you click on one of these guys, uh, you just end up uh, at a page where you can select these resources. And I need to figure out why that doesn't work. So having said that, um, let me leave you with a link to the lecture notes, which you're welcome to review in particular for the links. This is not going to be a stable URI. But with that, um, thanks for your attention. Any questions for Marcus? Okay, then we will um, move along to Sarah Weissman and Jenny Novachescu from Space Telescope Science Institute. Can everyone hear me? I can hear you, Sarah. Am I sharing my slides? We don't not yet. It's hitting the share button and it's not dismissing this little dialogue. Let me try again. And Sarah, let me know if you want me to try. If it's giving you trouble. <laughs> Technical difficulties. <laughs> uh, let's see. Share screen. Share. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, sorry about that. I had to enable the sharing in my preferences. Um, so hi, I'm Sarah Weissman. I'm a senior software engineer at uh, the Mikulski Archive at Space Telescope. And I'm going to be presenting with uh, my colleague Jenny Novachescu, who is the chief librarian Morning. at Space Telescope. And um, we're talking about implementing the UAT in the proposal process at ST um, and both the downstream and upstream impacts of integrating with the, with the thesaurus. Um, and then and we'll also be talking a, a little bit about um, the process, you know, the boots on the ground process of adopting the UAT and migrating from our existing vocabularies. Um, if you're not familiar with the Space Telescope Science Institute, uh, we're a research institute in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, we're operated by the Association of Universities for Research in Astronomy or ORA, lots of uh, acronyms. 
And uh, we help humanity explore the universe with advanced space telescopes. Um, and NAST is the archive, the Mikulski Archive, archive for Space Telescopes. That's a NASA funded project. Um, we're a multi mission archive. Um, and we're located at Space Telescope. Next slide. Um, Space Telescope uh, is in charge of the science operations for Hubble. Um, the science and we'll, science and flight operations for James Webb. Um, we'll be managing the science operations for the Roman Space Telescope, um, and then we uh, MAST has a pretty big data archive of a bunch of different missions, including TESS, Kepler K two, um, and a bunch of other ones. Uh, okay, so um, just wanted to give a little breakdown of kind of the the UAT's role in the life cycle of observation metadata at ST um, and sort of where the thesaurus comes up for us in that process. Um, so when uh, people are proposing for time on the telescope um, in, their, in their proposal, which they uh, produce in this astronomer's proposal tool or APT, um, they're asked to select uh, a set of scientific category keywords, which are now UAT aligned, um, that describe the goals of the proposal. Um, and these uh, scientific category keywords are actually used by, um, used to like, uh, used to assign the proposal for, for review by the committees that decide um, what proposals will be accepted for the telescope. So it's very important to have a comprehensive set of keywords there. Um, and then they also, proposers also select uh, target description keywords when they enter their targets for the telescope. Um, and right now the target description keywords have been aligned for UAT. I have a little asterisk there only for JWST. The HST target keywords are not yet aligned with UAT. Um, and so uh, the, where, the tar where the target keywords show up are actually, um, they show up for the end user of MAST. So they um, get uh, attached to the observational data as it goes through the data pi pipelines. Um, and then they're, they're made searchable in um, MAST interfaces. And, and then um, eventually, you know, after the data has been used and published, we also um, have a process by which we map the published literature to observational data through our bibliog bibliography tools and also um, our digital object identifier um, process, sorry. Um, and then uh, I think Alberto is gonna be talking a little bit about um, getting UAT keywords and ADS, but the goal is also to um, allow us to uh, com compare the, the UAT keywords that come off of publications with the UAT keywords that were attached to proposals um, and sort of understand like the full impact of um, the science and how the data gets used versus how the data is proposed to be used. Um, so it really like end to end, um, the UAT plays a role with our data life cycle. Um, and so where we started with um, the UAT was really in the second set of keywords, the target description keywords. Um, we had had, when I joined um, the Mikulski archive around six years ago, there was a long standing goal of finding a new vocabulary for the target descriptions. Um, and that was like right around the time when I think Katie was starting to give presentations about the like beginning of the UAT. So um, ST got involved pretty early on with the thesaurus with the goal of like adopting it for our tools. Um, and so, uh, this is just a little screenshot of the MAST portal and where the keywords show up when you do a search. Um, it, they, they show up, and this is something that actually probably needs to be improved in our software. They show up as like a list in, um, in, each, op in each observation row in, in the grid of observations, um, but they do show up with like the data and are presented to the end user and you can search them as part of um, I believe it's part of the advanced search for the portal. Um, so yeah, I was I was the one who worked on the target keyword mapping. 
Um, so I'm going to talk about that a little bit, and then Jenny is going to take over and talk about the keywords, the higher level scientific category keywords. Um, this was work that we did back in 2016, and um, at that time, um, I'm not sure exactly how many concepts the UAT had because it has a poly hierarchy. But when you take it and you spread it, put it in a spreadsheet, there are sort of there were like at that time around 1,047 paths through the thesaurus, and the the, the I think the longest path was nine levels. And then the target vocabulary um, that we were mapping had um, 238 concepts and they were grouped in eight sort of top level concepts and there's only two levels. So there's eight top level concepts and then the 238 concepts were in groups underneath them. And then um, sort of the additional complication was that we had this concept of external versus non-external at the top level. So you would label your observation as like a star that is internal, ex external to our galaxy versus non-external, um, for example. And then there was a category of descriptors that you could apply to all categories. So you could have like sort of attached a keyword that was like ring, bar, jet, or lobe to any, any other list of concepts that you had selected, um, allowing you to potentially like do things that didn't make any sense, which um, is not ideal. Um, so the process was really like similar to what Marcus was talking about. It was very manual mapping from the old keywords to new. We put everything in a spreadsheet and we sort of um, looked to see where the existing concepts aligned. And I unfortunately at that time did not like keep stats on exactly how that alignment worked um, and like how many we were able to map and how many we weren't. And then we also, I think what was very useful where we were able to look at stats on the usage of each of the um, current, the old keywords, uh, target keywords to see like how many times they have been used and the last time they have been attached to a proposal. So like, for example, like um, there was a keyword for FK Kome stars and it had only been used four times and the last time it had been used was like 1999. So that was like a pretty good candidate for like, maybe we don't need this in here anymore. Um, and maybe we could replace it with something more descriptive. And so we also went through a pretty comprehensive review where I had three different astronomers from our team um, uh, go through and mark the, cat, the keywords in the UAT in the spreadsheet as we should include, we shouldn't include, or we probably shouldn't include. And I, I, did, I forgot to mention, but the reason we weren't including everything was because like these keywords get presented as a pretty as flat lists to the users. And so we really needed to narrow it down. Like the developers of APT didn't want a thousand keywords in there. Um, so we essentially did this, did this um, spreadsheet process. And then I developed like a, a sort of on the fly heuristic to combine um, how I had ranked them and the usage and how the astronomers ranked them and to sort of just sort them. And once we had them sorted, we went through and kind of essentially took the top, you know, but we found like a cutoff in the score and took like um, around like the top 400 with a few sanity checks obviously thrown in. Um, and so you can, um, I should put this link in the chat or I guess the slides will be available later, but you can see now in the JWT documentation, these were these category, these sign, uh, target description keywords have been defined. They're in, the, they're in um, a wiki page there. We took out this um, external and non-external and like the all category descriptors. Um, there are definitely like some areas where the terms did not map well to UAT, like calibration and unidentified objects. Um, and so I think there's still areas where like with the help of an, a subject matter expert, we could improve the UAT or get some more words into the UAT. Um, just to highlight some of the things that changed. Um, the way we describe star categories used to be with this kind of mishmash of like letters and Roman numerals that were not like super user friendly. Um, and we changed that so that now the star categories look like A stars, A dwarfs, A giants, A subgiants, A supergiants versus like A0 through A3, B dash IV, like which um, is perhaps not like as user friendly. Um, and then there was a significant expansion, expansion of terms for uh, uh, ISM and galaxy categories. Um, and now I think Jenny, you're going to take over and talk about the scientific category keywords. 
All right. Good morning. So, Sarah, if you don't mind uh, driving the slides, I think we'll oh, okay. save sure. ourselves a transition. Yeah. Um, so, good morning. I'm Jenny Novachescu. I work with Sarah at Space Telescope Science Institute. As Sarah said, um, the assessment of the UAT for uh, space telescope purposes began actually with the target keywords, which is kind of later on in the process than the initial proposal keywords. So uh, we kind of started midstream. And after Sarah had done that work and the target keywords were implemented for James Webb, it became apparent, you know, it would make sense to align that first uh, experience that a user has with these keywords, uh, which are the proposal keywords that they find in the astronomer proposal tool. So um, I picked up on all the work that Sarah did. My colleague who's also on the line, Chris Wilkinson, also from Space Telescope, assisted with this. And we worked, uh, Sarah works again with the archive side where these descriptive target keywords go into their systems. I worked with Chris Wilkinson and our science policy group under our parent agency, the Science Mission Office uh, at Space Telescope. And we aligned the initial, if for Hubble, we would call them phase one for web, it's kind of all not quite sliced in two phases, we align these initial words with the UET as well. So that just happened for Hubble cycle 27, uh, two cycles ago, basically. And uh, because the initial proposal keywords are shared by both telescopes, this did affect, uh, again, both Hubble and Webb. Um, so like Sarah, I can talk a little bit about the process. I Sarah and I figured that's what most of you online would be most interested in is like, what does this really look like if you want to implement the UAT at your institution? Um, so similar to Sarah, we assess the usage of the existing 159 proposal keywords. They were grouped in seven main proposal panels like solar system, exoplanets, galaxies. We aligned each term to a UAT equivalent if it existed. Um, and I have a, a small chart later I'll show you as to how many actually aligned and how many didn't. And we suggested additional terms to our local proposal keywords if the UAT had a broader or narrower or both, you know, broader and narrower term that we thought would be advantageous to a proposer. Um, and we also, um, you can see, we actually expanded it similar to, it was kind of the opposite of Sarah's experience where they wanted to minimize um, you know, how much of a list they would see. We wanted to make sure we were expansive without going too far. So we went from 159 ways to describe your proposal to 100, about 200, 198. Um, and also this is unrelated, an additional panel was added, but I'll add that the reason I think, um, I can't speak for the science policy group directly, but part of the reason they felt comfortable adding an IGM and CGM panel was that there was now an expansive enough vocabulary because of the UAT. Um, so it made more sense to cut that off into its own panel at that point. Um, Sarah, we can go ahead to the next slide. Thank you for, yeah. Um, so <clears throat> really what Sarah and I wanted to spend a lot of time talking about is why did we do this, right? What, why go through this? What's the benefit to Space Telescope and to the users of our tools and products? Um, so the UAT was aligned for benefit for our institution, but also again for the users. Uh, one was, as Sarah said, it was really time. There, there needed to be, and probably this is the case for many of you in, in long operating observatories who are online, there really needed to be a systemic or systematic, I should say, proposal keyword review. Um, I believe for the these phase, I call them phase one for Hubble, but these earlier initial proposal keywords, they were looked at to some degree in about 2015. Um, however, web, you know, was soon coming online or is soon coming online. And it was obvious, for example, that there could be more infrared proposal related keywords, right? So this was an opportunity to do that alignment, add some additional vocabulary that a, that a James Webb proposer might need that weren't existing in the shared Hubble web keyword set till then. Um, so again, I think if nothing else, um, if you're looking to review your local vocabularies, that at that time, it is ideal to consider whether the UAT might be worth implementing. Um, I think you'll find that you can both expand your own and, and augment the UAT as well. Um, a big thing for us was reporting. So we get requests from, you know, director's office, the science policy group that I work with and Chris works with, the or a corporate office that runs Space Telescope, NASA itself. And they'll ask questions. I'm sure, again, for those of you who work in observatories that are online, they'll, they'll ask and say things like, you know, how many of your proposals are related to solar system? Uh, either, you know, if the initial proposal or the targets or some combination. 
Because the UET is hierarchical, it's much easier to roll up those sorts of keywords and give reporting. Um, reporting is still, I think, a challenge. But again, because we're following some semblance of a hierarchy, thanks to the UAT, and I will say, even though the hierarchy is not directly in our local systems, that reporting has become much easier. Um, and I think the potential to, to do this in a systematic and automated way is there, but we haven't fully taken advantage of it. I'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, as Sarah said, there's a lot of linkages between the data, the publications that are now available to us. That's really kind of the end goal. So if you have someone that says, I'm, I'm submitting a proposal and it's about galaxy formation and related to that, some of my targets are stellar. That would make sense. But then 10 years later, someone else goes back and uses that archival data and they develop you know a paper that's about cosmology this is actually a way that you can see that so i think understanding the full science impact of the initial data is kind of the goal here um, and again by using the uat at each phase that's possible and then as sarah said we do use proposal keywords and reviewer matching um, so being able to match both the proposal keyword with the reviewer's publication history once the uat is more fully implemented by other publishers and in the ads itself um, it will be easier to basically validate that matching and be sure that this expert on these topics is matched to these proposals on those same topics. We do have a good system. There's a link to that publication right now that's, that's been developed by one of the science policy group members. Uh, but again, the idea is to be able to use the UAT to validate that matching into the future. Um, Sarah, we can move to the next slide. Thank you. Um, and then I do want to add uh, both Anne from, uh, I think, DPS and Sherry Winkleman actually brought this up earlier when they were sending some chats and asking questions. One of the reasons that we wanted to share our experience today was to show you that there's obviously a benefit to the community at large. So by looking at the keyword alignment, just for the portion that my group did, um, not even speaking to all the effort that Sarah put in, because there were a number of additions to the UAT through her work, just with those 159 initial proposal keywords, uh, about 20% of those were submitted and added to the UAT. So as Sherry was saying, you know, there's not a lot of high energy terms. We feel like there needs to be more. Um, it is a ton of effort. There's no, you know, we can't say otherwise to do this initial work, but once it's done, you're actually augmenting the UAT itself for the community at large so that other people with other tools and processes and proposal types can use that wider vocabulary. So again, about 20% of our keywords actually had to be submitted and added to the UAT. And I don't know that all of them, uh, I'd have to go back, ultimately got added, but I'd say the fair portion of them did. Um, and below were just some examples, things like biosignatures, um, disformation, some granularity there, exoplanet terms. We, there were a lot of uh, contributors to that beyond Space Telescope. We helped contribute to some of the expansion of the exoplanet terms as well. Um, Sarah, we can move on. Thank you. And then just to give you kind of a visual breakdown of those 159 terms, um, you can see about 75%, so I'm looking at exact match and synonymous match, about 75% of those terms um, were already in the UAT. It was, it was a ton of effort to map them. It was that other 20 some percent that calls the most, you know, it was the most time. So again, additions to the UAT were about 30 some terms. And then as uh, both Sarah and Marcus um, alluded to, you're gonna probably end up with a couple terms that just can't realistically be mapped. So Sarah gave the example, example of calibration. Uh, Marcus, I think was giving, uh, I don't remember the exact example, Marcus, in your slide, but um, for us, it was things like the fields, like Hubble Ultra Deep Field, legacy fields. You know, there's not, we're getting into more targets um, there in the sense of like, um, you know, Simbad almost. So they weren't things that really appropriate for the UAT, I'd say. And while they do still exist in our local vocabulary, because it's very unique to our institution, um, they weren't things that we proposed to map to the UAT. So I just want to say again, as Sarah and Marcus point out, sometimes there's going to be outliers you know, what we do with those is kind of a larger issue, not for today, but um, if that's your experience, it's it's what we've all found. Um, and Sarah, I think probably we have the last slide. Um, so just some future initiatives, uh, just what else are we gonna be doing for the UET at Space Telescope and MAST? Um, number one, it's today. What is today about? It's about increasing awareness of the UET and the wider community. Um, Sherry made this point as well when she commented earlier if other institutions see how this work is being done, they understand, you know, kind of how much it's going to be up front, but what it's worth and how they can use those mappings once they're in place in their local systems, um, then we've we've achieved something today. 
Um, so we want the wider community at Space Telescope, but then a, just outside in all of astronomy to understand how to search, how to contribute, um, consider local integrations like the things MAST and the Science Policy Group at Space Telescope have done. Um, an example, we've locally had our research staff consider tagging their personal web pages. If they say they're expert in a field, use a UAT term um, instead of just kind of a random vocabulary term that you come up with. Um, improving archival discovery, Sarah can answer questions about this if there are any later on, but um, Marcus had just presented his section on the VO registry. Work is being done to align that locally within MAST. Um, another MAST staff member is doing that. Um, Sarah just presented ADAS about the mass collection discovery via graph databases. It was a point of concept she introduced in 2020 and we'll be working on. And then um, this came up as well. Uh, Anne gave this example for, um, for DPS. Uh, we're looking at using the UAT to provide crosswalks to larger data products like high, high level science products at MAST um, so that someone says, okay, I want something on, you know, this sort of stellar physics topic. And if we have a data set related to that, it'd be easier to map to it. So that's something we need to be implementing more of in MAST as well. Um, and then we do need to align these, what we call phase two, or just generically target keywords for Hubble. Um, the history of that, I'll be honest, is a little bit lost to me as to why we started with Webb, probably because it was a new telescope and there was a lot of opportunity there versus going back and mapping as well against Hubble. So that's something we'll be looking at internally in the next year or so um, to see how we'll go about it. And again, just implementing um, system, systematic maintenance local vocabularies is, is a huge benefit here. So um, we don't directly integrate with the UAT. We don't use the URIs in our local systems, but we'd like to. It's just a matter of um, the engineering that we need to consider. Uh, it is possible. Katie pointed out the tools that are available to you to do that, map, to do that integration. Um, this would minimize the need to manually verify the terms, which do evolve. As Marcus said, those preferred terms are designed to change because the vocabulary and the science changes. So we do have to look at those about annually at this point and make sure that a term is not being called something else now in the UAT in a human readable form. If we use the URIs, that would not necessarily be necessary. That wouldn't be necessary. Um, so we're looking at, again, establishing an annual review of both proposal and target terms. We haven't done that yet, but how is this review going to look uh, for space telescope and mass to something we now need to consider? And one thing we've not done a whole lot of other than initial implementation is a process for deprecating terms from our local vocabularies based on usage. So we did this when we did the integration right now and the mapping, uh, but doing that on a continual basis is still something we need to devise. Um, locally, you know, how often are we going to do that? What's the conditions for deprecating, et cetera. Um, so I'll stop there. I know that we have other pr presentations that interest the time. And again, we'll be willing to uh, take questions toward the end after I think it's uh, Alberto and Peter up next. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah and Jenny. Um, I think we'll move, uh, Peter. Peter Toivin, you have a question? Yeah, a quick one. So about the archiving, I think it's very great that in the, uh, essentially in the archive research that you want to do through MAST or so, that we have available those uh, UAT terms. But if you have a set of unrelated or you've searched for a number of, let's say, FITS files that you grabbed out of the archive, have you lost what the UATs are or are they stored in the FITS file itself? That's probably a question um, for Sarah. Yeah, I guess I'm I'm not 100% sure if that metadata gets attached to the FITS file. Um, so I'm not involved in the actual processing that gets into the database. I could certainly ask some of the people on our team and get, get back to you about that, Peter. OK. Next up is Peter Williams, um, AAS Innovation Scientist, to talk about the UAT in the AAS journals. Peter? Oops, just realized I needed to unmute myself. Um, yeah, so I'm Peter Williams. I'm the Innovation Scientist at the AAS uh, and the CFA. Um, and I've been uh, involved a little bit in this. And so I'm going to talk about UAT in the AAS journals. I do want to emphasize, though, that I'm not on the front lines of, of dealing with the manuscripts and the authors and implementing this stuff, um, unlike some people on this call. Uh, so it's going to be a little bit more of a high level view. And uh, also we're a bit behind schedule, but I really only have a few key points that I wanted to make. So um, I think I can move through this pretty quickly. Uh, so as uh, Katie mentioned at the outset, 
uh, AAS journals have been using the UAT for about a year and a half now. Um, and uh, one thing that I guess I didn't really appreciate, which I should have at the time, was we sort of set this cutoff date to of uh, June last year when we started doing that. Um, but there was this long transition period because you know articles are submitted and take their time to work their way through the refereeing system. So you know it wasn't just a, a you know a flip of a switch. Um, I think even you know as of a few months ago, you occasionally still see articles with the old subject keywords um, appearing. I, I have to imagine that this is pretty much fully transitioned at this point. Although I don't know, don't have those stats myself. Um, I won't really go into the motivation of the switch. So obviously AAS being a sponsor of the UAT project, uh, you know, we think the UAT is a great thing and having this system that's updated and updatable uh, as a way to describe the articles that we, uh, that our authors are submitting is really valuable to us. Um, so I would say overall, the implementation felt pretty straightforward. So uh, the folks at eJournal Press uh, implemented that chooser widget that uh, Katie showed before. So um, I do my slides in HTML so I can just embed it directly in my slides. I wanna show that off. Um, but so yeah, we have this way that authors can search for keywords with autocomplete and explore related concepts. And so if I click on a concept name here, it uh, navigates the uh, information about the, the concept. And if I click the plus sign, it actually adds it to the list of concepts that will be associated with my article. So this is, what our, this is what authors see during the submission stage. And we have kind of a nice thing where uh, it's just a required part of the submission process. So, you know, there's no convincing people to think about using it. It just becomes something that, that they encounter during the submission process. Um, I also want to note that this, uh, this chooser is an open, open source. I think Katie did mention that before. Here's the GitHub link. Um, so it's, you know, drop dead easy to integrate into your own um, into any web interfaces that you might have that might involve people selecting UAT concepts. And I think one of the things that we've learned is that uh, this little search box with autocomplete is really important. Um, I was certainly concerned one difference between the UAT and the old astronomy subject keyword system uh, is that UAT is just much bigger and I thought people might have problems with that. But I think what we found is that if you can search for what you want, um, that size is not a problem anymore. And uh, in, in collaboration with kind of the fact that there is this hierarchical organization uh, to the system. Um, it seems like, yeah, the as far as I've perceived, we can add a lot more concepts and I don't think it's gonna cause problems for people in their usage. Um, when we were working on the implementation, the technical risk that I was worried about the most is uh, this fact that has kind of come up before of uh, making sure that what the authors specify makes its way through the entire production process into the metadata that we publish about our published articles uh, with the correct semantic information. In particular, this idea that uh, UAT concepts have a textual description uh, and they also have this unique identifier, which, you know, most formally should be URI. We can just also use a number and, and not worry about it too much. But the identifier is the thing that really counts. You know, um, if we, you can imagine, you might translate the terms into French and it might be la lune instead of moon. Um, and so making sure that, you know, we don't just have parentheses around, but we actually have structured data. And one of those structures is a list of these identifier strings um, is important. Uh, and for, you know, uh, I think especially in publishing world where the production process and the publishing process is a partnership with a lot of different uh, people. Uh, so for our, um, you know, we've got our own processes and then we've got eJournal Press on the peer review side and IOP on the production side. Uh, you know, it's not super complex what we have to do in principle, but um, just making sure that the implementation does that when you've got a bunch of partners communicating with each other is you know something to pay attention to, but uh, I that's you know I think it went great and um, the metadata are getting posted correctly and so um, yeah it's just something to be aware of. But uh, again, it's it's nothing profoundly subtle in the end. It's just being thorough about making sure that every little step does the right thing. 
Uh, another thing that in principle you can worry about um, is this versioning where having an evolving vocabulary is super important. I think that's one of the most important characteristics uh, about the UAT, but that does, especially again, in our kind of lengthy process, uh, cause worries about, you know, maybe on the submission side, they're using version three and then IOP is using version four and then someone, you know, has a keyword and we disagree about whether they're allowed to use uh, that concept or not. Um, I think the main thing that makes this uh, not something to worry about too much is the uh, regular release cycle that the UAT has. And I really wanna emphasize this. Um, so in broader software engineering, people will call this like the release train model of having periodic scheduled releases. And you know, you know when the train's gonna leave the station and if you miss that train, you know when the next train's gonna be. Um, and uh, a lot of large software projects have kind of adopted this over the past decade or so. And I think it's really, um, it's, it's a really important innovation because it really just makes it much easier to plan about these things. You know, you're not racing at the last minute to try and, uh, you know, cram something in and you know, okay, every December we're gonna have a UAT update. We should, you know, decide whether we wanna uh, adopt it or, or wait till next year. Um, and, uh, you know, that allows you to kind of build the systems where it becomes just part of what you do as opposed to panicking because, you know, you're not used to it. Like, you know, the way that leap seconds are a mess because they happen so rarely that no one's really prepared to deal with them when they do happen. Um, paired with this is the fact that, you know, uh, breaking changes like, you know, the removal of concepts is going to essentially hopefully almost never happen, maybe literally never happen, uh, but at most be extremely rare. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll move forward, but we'll maintain compatibility, which means that upgrading from an older version to a newer version is something that you don't have to worry about too much. Uh, I would say overall, it feels like the rollout has gone really, really beautifully. Um, I, you know, I was expecting that researchers are cantankerous and they don't like change. And I was expecting we'd get a lot of people complaining about like, what'd you do with my old keyword? And I can't copy paste my keywords anymore. Um, but my impression is that we've had very little of that. And uh, with the chooser widget, um, most people seem to have been able to hop over to the new system pretty easily. And then some communities like lab astrophysics, which were not well served before, um, seem to be you know very happy to have better ways to describe what they've done. And you know we've seen a few areas for improvement, but uh, really nothing dramatic uh, in terms of the process that we envisioned and how it's actually worked in practice. Um, you could imagine sort of going deeper with this. Uh, so for instance, right now, what we have uh, to kind of assign manuscripts to editors and referees, we have this corridors framework of some broad high level astrophysics concepts. You could imagine a world where we use UAT um, for that kind of taxonomy instead. Um, I wouldn't say that's something that we feel is particularly urgent, um, but if you've got your own processes where, you know, instead of rolling your own system, uh, you could use the UAT for that kind of work. Uh, if we didn't have ADS, uh, you know, there would be much wailing and gnashing of teeth and life would be terrible. Um, and also we would worry about, okay, can we use the UAT to help our authors discover our papers? Um, in the world that we are fortunate enough to live in, uh, basically we push that work off to ADS and, and hope that they'll uh, deliver a great solution for that. Um, likewise, uh, you know, we do have our papers on the old keyword system and it would be very interesting to retroactively uh, map them to UAT concepts in our back files. Uh, that's another thing that's uh, hopefully can be done more at the ADS scale of analyzing the overall existing astrophysics literature uh, as opposed to, you know, just happening within the AAS journals. Um, because hopefully these concepts should, uh, you know, map between the particular journal in which certain concepts in which they appear. Uh, one final thing that I want to mention is, you know, as I've uh, seen the kind of things that we're working on at AAS Publishing these days, uh, UAT is one piece of kind of this bigger picture of there's all sorts of vocabularies that you can apply to manuscripts. Uh, you know, there's author identity. We identify, the, you know, perf perfectly identify them with ORCIDs. Uh, there's funder F for research funders. There's ROR for people's affiliations. You know, when you're getting discipline specific things, there's, you know, SIBAD and, and ways to refer to specific astronomical objects. 
we've got telescope facilities, we've got data sets, we've got software. And more and more, you know, what we're doing as publishers is, you know, attaching high value metadata is an important aspect of what we do. Um, and the UAT is kind of one example of how we help authors with this. And I think from my experience, um, you know, authors, bless their hearts, they have the best of intentions, but they're really bad at creating this metadata themselves. And that's where we add value as publishers. Um, and these different kinds of vocabularies, you know, they differ in terms of how domain specific they are, how controlled they are, how often we expect them to evolve. Um, but it's all kind of examples of this uh, general, general uh, way in which we add value by uh, being a little bit more structured in how we um, analyze the, the things that we're that we're processing, um, you know, explicitly assigning concepts as opposed to just sort of having people do a full text search for black hole or whatever. Um, that's all that I had. And so I think I'll stop there. And um, yeah, if there's any questions now, or we can move on to what Alberto has to say. Thanks, Peter. Anne, you have a question? Yeah, just a quick one. Do you have a mechanism for collecting input from authors who do not find keywords that uh, correctly specify the concepts related to their papers? Uh, yeah, so I just, uh, when you asked about that earlier, I checked on our submission pages. And uh, when we have the, the prompt to, to specify those keywords, we don't have anything very specific about um, you know, go here if what you want is missing. Um, I have to admit, like, from my experience in other kinds of fields, you know, sometimes honestly, I'm a little reluctant to ask people for their, you know, random input or their wish lists um, of, you know, oh, I wish you had a concept for like my extremely niche thing that, you know, is not generally agreed upon. Um, but on the other hand, uh, so I think there's kind of a, you know, a, a spectrum there of how much you want to encourage people to submit that kind of stuff. And I think basically what controls where we sit on that spectrum is uh, how much, you know, we can get Katie to sift through people's random hobby courses all day. Um, well, but right now we don't have to admit, uh, we don't offer anything very explicit about that. Yeah, I, of course I'm asking because I was affected by this. Uh, and the journal was the Planetary Science Journal, which is relatively new. And the closest I could get was astroinformatics. And frankly, that's not really helpful. Um, and if, it, I mean, part of it is that there aren't a lot of papers on that subject, but there are other journals. So this may be one of those areas of the UAT that just needs to be developed so that it becomes available. Yeah, um, I think overall, I mean, a big part of, you know, there's UAT is the specific vocabulary, but the user experience that we build around it of how people interact with it and what they're used to um, is a big part of that. Like one of the amusing issues we had was uh, we have a few papers that are tagged with a concept labeled chaos, uh, where the people who tagged it meant chaos theory, uh, but the concept is supposed to mean chaos, the minor planet. Um, and so, you know, this is kind of a usability issue of of um, making sure that things are properly labeled and, and helping people out. And so I think, yeah, it's pretty clear, especially that given that um, having more concepts seems fine. Like you don't overload people if you have a good search functionality. Uh, so being making it easier for people to flag weaknesses um, seems like a valuable thing. All right, I don't wanna take up too much time. But I do see Adele had a question about, can I comment on other journals? Are they also working on some similar keyword efforts? Uh, short answer, yes, and we certainly uh, want to encourage as many journals as possible who publish things in the astrophysics world to, to move to the UAT. I think, you know, one of the big benefits is having a community resource that's updated. That means that, you know, if we can all converge on it, then uh, what happens in ADS, what happens, you know, throughout the entire astronomy science lifecycle uh, becomes way better. So that's certainly what we're hoping to see. And I'll, uh, I think I should pass it off there in the interest of time. Okay, Alberto, over to you. Okay, <clears throat> let me share my screen. Share. 
Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, I'll try to keep this um, short and sweet. Um, just uh, a few slides to describe what our plans are in terms of uh, leveraging the UAT to make life better for our users, hopefully. Um, so what, what does the UAT bring to uh, a system like ADS, which is built around uh, you know, search and discovery of content? Um, well, there's multiple ways in which having a uh, you know, well-indexed uh, set of uh, data could provide us. First of all, it would allow us to better understand what the user is looking for. Um, imagine somebody writing down, typing down a few words to describe the general subject area that they're interested in. Um, if they were guided by um, proper auto completion or providing a list of um, uh, specific keywords, they may do better uh, at formulating their own query. Um, we would also be able to um, properly tag and identify the proper concepts that are actually discussed in papers, regardless of how those concepts have been expressed in um, certain, you know, in English or even a foreign language. Um, that goes hand in hand with the disambiguation issue that some terms are ambiguous and their meaning depends on the context in which they appear. So disambiguating the, um, you know, the, the way in which a particular concept is, um, sorry, disambiguating a particular use of the word will depend on an analysis of its context. And the additional interesting um, uh, thing that uh, Thesaurus brings to the table is uh, built-in hierarchy and relationships between the concepts. So you can start inferring uh, based, on, um, based on the hierarchy what topics are being uh, addressed in a paper. And all of this, you know, when you, if we're able to leverage all of this, uh, we believe that we would be able to provide better insights to users in a variety of ways. So I'll give you a couple of ideas uh, of examples here. So one of the first issues that um, a thesaurus can help us with is that of normalization. Here, I just used the autocomplete tool that Peter was demoing earlier. And if I type gamma ray bursts, I can see that it corresponds to a concept in the UAT, um, this is the, the first entry here, but there's many other ways in which this concept can be, can manifest itself. So you have singular and plurals and acronyms and Greek letters assigned, um, you know, that can be used to express the same, um, the, the, the same concept. So here we see different variations of the same concept. And that's, that's something that as a search engine, we want to build in so that we have better recall when uh, any one of these instances is searched for. The other one that I, I um, mentioned already is disambiguation. If um, a word is ambiguous, then you don't really, um, you know, you can't really provide good accuracy in your search results. You can't pr uh, create a precise search. So accretion will have different meanings. Um, there is actually a concept named accretion in the UAT, but uh, you know, its definition will specify what is meant by accretion in that context. And then there's other qualified ways to um, discuss other kinds of accretion in the literature. So that's um, another way in which we can provide a better discovery experience. And the hierarchy that I, um, I mentioned earlier um, so if you search for Jupiter's, you will find, if you search for Jupiter, you find the planet, uh, you find also mentions of exoplanets, hot Jupiter's and Jovians, etc. So if you're specifically searching for, uh, hot Jupiter's, um, you know, and you have in front of you a, um, a hierarchy of concepts, then you would know exactly where to go and look for the search term. So what about the fact that we've had keywords in the past in many of the papers? Well, those are good. I mean, keywords have been useful. And ADS has tried, um, to some extent, to normalize them. Um, 
you know, it helped that the major astronomy journals had keywords um, and assigned keywords, you know, had co a common set of keywords that we'll call subject headings. Um, however, our experience is that um, th they're not ideal. First of all, they're incomplete. Not all subject areas are covered by um, keywords, as you might expect with, you know, most knowledge bases can't possibly cover everything. Um, there's some subjective, you know, we get all kinds of um, papers can come with uh, different numbers and different use of the keywords. Some of these terms are ambiguous. The example that Peter gave about chaos is shows that this happens now and it's happened in the past. Um, and the, the biggest issue is that it's very sparse coverage. Only, basically only the refereed literature tends to have subject headings or any kind of keywords associated with this. So if you don't have good metadata, you don't have keywords associated with them. And also there's areas of literature covered by ADS that are not astronomy, so the astronomy keywords won't apply. So if we use those keywords as a filter to narrow and find particular papers, this is not a good filter. It, we would be doing a disservice to the user to encourage this kind of um, action. So what about um, using them for discovering more general terms? Um, we do collect and actually index all the keywords that come from the different sources um, of an article. Here, I'll give you an example of the kind of things that we get when we throw all the keywords in a kitchen sink. Um, so here we have um, the subject categories that came from the archive um, submission, as well as um, the you know, descriptive keywords from the paper, as well as the UAT concepts. As you can see, they're not treated very nicely in, in the way they're currently ingested by our system. So the numbers that you see in the keyword list correspond to the U UAT concepts. So what we've not done yet is basically turn those concepts into actionable links. Um, and, and we haven't cross-linked each one of them because for the same reason, because a cross-linking would also result in a very um, small selection of papers. Only the papers that have UAT terms would come up when you do a search uh, with those terms. So ideally, once we have greater adoption of UAT terms um, and uh, done across our corpus, um, we would be able to um, use each one of these, you know, show a hierarchical um, breakdown of the keywords that are assigned to a paper with the hierarchy and make all of those uh, items in the hierarchy clickable so that the user can then discover related papers through this mechanism. And why are these useful more in general at the, you know, for the ADS uh, suite of tools um, that um, allow people to get better insights into what they're looking at. Well, first of all, we could use these concepts um, to kind of label um, different sets of papers here. I show uh, what you get from the so-called paper network, which does a clustering of search results. And then we throw some extracted words to each one of these clusters. So these words, again, uh, they're not always the best descriptors of that content. If we had keywords here, that would be a much better option for the user. Uh, and the same approach is for, you know, the, the world cloud, word cloud that some people use in our system. All of these are clickable words um, that get extracted from a set of results, but again, not very descriptive and ambiguous at this point. So the plan um, is the following. Uh, and, and up until now, this is what we've been doing. The first bullet point is about promotion of the UAT as a standard way, not just to, um, to kind of assign keywords to the literature, but we hope that it gets used um, to attach concepts to data sets and software as well. Um, and then as far as implementing this, uh, the use of UAT within ADS, we will start cross-linking uh, what I described early concepts within our system in 2021, so uh, soon enough. Um, 
and we hope that in that way users will start becoming familiar with the um, the concepts as they appear uh, associated and attached to their papers um, the the long-term goal for us is to be able to use natural language processing and machine learning approaches to kind of um, detect topics uh, in the papers that we index in our system. We believe that we'll be able to do that for papers for which we have the full text indexed in our system, but we'll also try to uh, do our best to uh, detect topics just from analysis of the abstract itself. Um, and then we start introducing the topics as ways to filter the literature and uh, enhance our visualizations like I showed you earlier. Um, and finally, one thing that we'll worry about is that um, extend the use of thesauri more in general in our system for those areas outside of astronomy that are covered um, by ADS. So uh, we don't yet know how well this is going to go. But for instance, the you know articles uh, that we index from other physics journals, the APS journals, for instance, um, would require different terms to be properly described. So um, we hope that the approach of using, um, you know, this knowledge-based systems that can link to each other um, in a sort of distributed way um, is going to provide the solution to this problem. And that's it um, for my presentation. Um, I'll take any questions. Well, thank you everyone for attending today. Um, we still welcome your questions and comments. And so if you didn't put them in the chat, um, there is a site for this, this meeting that will um, include the slides and contact information and, and uh, we would appreciate your feedback and your questions um, after, after we're done here. Any final thoughts or questions from the panelists, from the audience? Um, if not, on behalf of the steering committee for the UAT, we thank you very much for attending and look forward to um, connecting with you again uh, on the UAT. We hope very much that uh, the UAT will be adopted elsewhere. Uh, let us know how we can help you with that. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.